A lot of people think that GP is all sort of coughs and colds, but it really isn't. How many days has this? <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Catherine and I am a junior doctor based in London. I am a specialty trainee in general practice, so I am a GPST1, which means that I'm in my first of three years to become fully qualified as a general practitioner or a GP. And I started my training about four months ago. But when I was applying this time last year, I didn't really know what day-to-day -day life would involve as a GP trainee. So I thought it would be a good idea to make the video that I wanted to watch this time last year. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover two days of a day in the life of a GP trainee. And I hope you find this useful, so come along! At 7am my alarm goes off, I get out of bed hopefully without much struggle. I brush my teeth and I wash my face, and then I do a quick 10 minute meditation on calm. I have breakfast which is porridge with granola and honey, and then I head to unlock my bike. And this is how I get to work, I started cycling this year and it has been fab. I strap on my bag, I put my lights on, and then I've got this bluetooth speaker which allows me to blast music slash podcast on the way to work. This is my room, it's got everything that I need, a computer, a printer, my equipment, a weighing scale, BNF on the shelf, which is a national formulary. Currently we are in the midst of the second wave of COVID-19 here in the UK. At the moment, most of my consults are remote, so either through telephone or e-consultations. But I do have TCI slots, so what they are, face-to-face -face slots for um, patients that you feel you need to bring in. What's cool about the training practice that I'm in at the moment is that they've got an e-consultation platform. So that's going to be majority of my day. The latter half of the morning I've got a tutorial with my trainer and then I've got some audit time. Doing a audit or a quality improvement project is mandatory for all GP trainees, I think in every single year of training. After that we've got a clinical meeting, so that's when the multidisciplinary team, which is made up of doctors, nurses, pharmacists, we talk about um, difficult cases, cases that people are not sure what the next step in the management plan can be. And then after that, I've got a break for lunch and then I go straight back into e-consultations. Let's get on with the day. In terms of e-consultations, patients can log on to the website or download the app and type in their presenting complaint. In this particular e-consultation session, I received an e-consult from someone who had suspicious features suggestive of bowel cancer. So here I am organizing for them to have a poo test, um, which essentially looks for changes in the stool that might be suggestive of something like bowel cancer. E-consultations definitely require a different skill set, which we've never been exposed to before. So I'm really glad I've got this opportunity to develop this skill. This is especially since I do feel like e-consultations are going to stay in the future even after the pandemic has passed, so it's a good thing that I type quickly. In today's tutorial with my trainer Dr Qureshi, we went through an audit I did of recent cancer diagnosis within the surgery and we discussed points of improvement or system changes that we could implement to improve cancer diagnosis. We then put an entry of this onto my portfolio and we go on to review the other logs, reflections and assessments that I've put on there. To speak a bit about the portfolio, for GB trainees this is hosted on a website called 14 Fish, which doesn't involve any marine life and is quite expensive to go on actually. This is essentially an online record of all your educational activity during GB GP training. Here's what it looks like. As you can see on the left, there's lots of different types of learning logs you can enter onto a portfolio. And the purpose of the logs is to show evidence that you're fulfilling the curriculum set out by the Royal College of General Practitioners or the RCGP. This criteria is further divided into clinical experience groups and capabilities. In this tutorial, I also go through my multi-sourced feedback questionnaire, which is an anonymous survey sent to various clinical and non-clinical members of the GP surgery. And I was glad to hear that I received good feedback. Good feedback from patients, good feedback from junior clinical mm -hmm. staff, good feedback from admin. Exactly. Finally, as it was one of my last tutorials on my GP placement, we went through my portfolio and ensured that I hit all the requirements for that particular placement. Here's a table of what's needed. Essentially, it's a long list of three letter acronyms. The main thing to bear in mind is that as a GP trainee, you have to do a lot of learning logs, which are reflections on patient encounters. After my tutorial, my trainer, Dr. Qureshi, kindly agreed to go on camera to ask him some questions about GP training. 
sort of what led you to go into it and how your experience has been so far? I think the main thing is I enjoy training. I think also it's also shaped by your experience. So yeah. when I had my trainer, I was a very good trainer. So I think I was inspired by his teaching methods because I think just doing clinical sessions can burn you out. So sometimes that teaching can keep you fresh, keep active. Yeah. So that's the main reason to do teaching. Yeah. So you enjoy it, but it also prevents burnout and it just varies your workload. It forces you to keep up to date. Yeah. Because the trainees will ask you questions, you'll have to read up guidelines <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you yeah. keep up to date. So I think it keeps you sharp. The key thing is when you're training, you're protected. So my advice for training is do as much as you can, get as much exposure, push yourself in these years. Because when you're GP, you're not going to get that support. You've got your own MD, and GMC number. Yep. Go ahead. Yep. <laughs> Ultimately, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. while as a trainee, you're more supported. Yeah. So if you're put in complex situations, you've got your trainer to support you. So I mean, what I did as a trainee is my trainer pushed me, treated me like a GP in terms of workload, like duty, prescriptions, home visits, chairing meetings, understanding cough. All that allowed me to be confident. So when I first day after BTS, yeah, you don't you don't get fixed. Yeah. So that's the key thing. If you push yourself in these years, um, do more than what's needed, it will benefit you in your career long term. Yeah. This is it's an apprenticeship decision. The more you see, the more you reflect. The more you refine your practice, the better you'll be. And I don't mean a cringe every log. I mean actually in your mind thinking. How can I make this consultation better? What can I do to improve my clinical skills? It's a similar thing like surgical training. The more you operate, the better you're going to yeah. become. If you're going to be a surgical reg, being shy of operations, you won't be a good consultant. Yeah. Um, because when you're a consultant, it's like, well, carry on. You're yeah. the boss now. You need yeah, to yeah. operate. See loads of patients, expose yourself, and understand how primary care works in the general health in, um, economy. And then that will put you in good shape when you finish STP. Great. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I've been trying to get a hold of the neurology secretaries. One moment, put your through. Right, thank you. You're welcome. So I've just come back from the clinical meeting and honestly it's one of the highlights of the week. I say this because general practice sometimes can be quite isolating even as a trainee because you're in a room by yourself um, you're making your own decisions you're forming your own management plans whereas for example um, training in the hospital is very much more sort of teamwork based where you have a lot of different people within a team like junior doctors registrars and consultants and you get to bounce off each other general practice is quite different in that sense so the clinical meeting gives us an opportunity to sort of share the burden of difficult cases so now I'm just about to to start my afternoon session of e-consultations. I'll just get on with things and then I'll touch base in a bit. Some think GPs only see coughs, colds and back pains, but this is far from the reality. Frequently I've had to manage complex patients with multiple comorbidities. For e-consultations, which involve a younger population, you might not get the complexity, but there's definitely variety. This afternoon's cases included a bleeding in early pregnancy, a patient recently diagnosed with hemochromatosis, and a parent worried about a child's development. This requires knowledge of a wide range of specialties within medicine, which was personally a big attraction towards general practice. So now I'm just going to debrief in my trainer. Normally what I do is I just go through my clinic and then I write down any queries I have in my notebook. But also it's a good time to talk through non-clinical things. So for example, a difficult patient encounter, um, difficulty with communication skills, for example. Um, it's really good just to debrief so you can get some feedback as to how you can improve things for next time. So I'll do that and then I just got a couple of admin stuff to do and then it should be home time. Power on. Welcome to day two of the vlog. If I have a moment in the mornings, I enjoy tending to my plants. It's especially exciting today as I notice my monstera had a new leaf. I have some breakfast, same as yesterday, but I do this fancy swirly thing with the honey. 
Luckily, today's weather is beautiful and I tried to take it all in during my cycle before arriving to work and settling down for my morning clinic. With my newly pumped tires, I actually get to work in record time, so I have to down a glass of water before anything. On Wednesday mornings, I act up as duty doctor, which means that all the patients I see have appointments booked on the day. I'm also the first point of call for any emergencies. As such, it tends to be a bit more of an acute caseload. So I've got nine patients to call this morning. I suspect I'll probably bring about at least, I'll say at least four of them in. Now, obviously it depends on the caseload. If there are more children, then I'll bring more of them in. Um, if, for example, they're more vulnerable, they have more comorbidities, they sound more unwell, then obviously I have to bring them in. But some of the queries might be a bit more simple. So things like medication queries that I can just deal with on the phone. So let's get started. Oh, you can get pain when you pass urine, extreme pain. If the urine samples have come back negative, then it could be the stone. After my telephone calls, I have my face-to-face -face appointment, so I put on my PPE. Here's the equipment that I use, a blood pressure machine, pulse oximeter, stethoscope, a measuring tape, thermometer, and an otoscope. Face-to-face -face interactions take slightly more time because it involves changing PPE and cleaning everything. So I've just finished my morning clinic and it was really interesting. Um, a good variety of different types of pathology. Out of the nine that I spoke to on the telephone this morning, I brought in four patients and actually one of them, after speaking to them on the phone, I directed them straight to A&E um, because it sounded like they were in discomfort over the phone. They had quite severe abdominal pain, struggling to mobilize, struggling to stand up. Um, then that was sort of a red flag in my mind to just send them straight into A&E. One thing I want to mention is um, the difficulty of doing telephone consultations in general, especially because I'm practicing in an area where not a lot of people speak English. There's multiple layers of information that is being lost through consulting this way. I really, really struggled with this when I first started here. I've learned to change the way that I ask my questions to be a bit more direct. In medical school, they always say start with open questions, but this is a bit difficult when you have a language barrier and you're using an interpreter over the phone. So I just need to do a couple of referrals from today. I need to look at my blood tests, look at my documents. And after that, I'll be going home for afternoon GP training, which is happening remotely over Zoom slash Teams. And here's me again, typing rapidly to get my admin done. On reflection, though it was scary at the start, I'm really glad my trainer gave me the opportunity to step up as the duty doctor. It has given me an additional opportunity to improve and refine my clinical skills, which is especially valuable as GP training during COVID means less face-to-face -face contact time to develop my consultation or examination skills with the patient in front of me. Before heading home for my teaching, I thought I'd share my weekly timetable as a GPST1 and a GP placement, starting with how many patients I see in a clinic and how much time I have for each consultation. In a typical non-pandemic setting, um, I will probably have between 15 to 20 minutes uh, per patient face-to-face -face appointment. But because of COVID, we basically agreed to convert the 20 minutes into a split 10-minute telephone call and then a 10-minute TCI, which is a face-to-face -face slot. Uh, for a normal clinic session, I will have nine patients. So I'll have nine 10-minute telephone call slots and then I'll have nine 10-minute face-to-face slots. So on Monday morning, I have a normal clinic session. Monday afternoon, I've got my personal development time where I can do self-directed learning or I can log on to my portfolio to do some reflections. Tuesday we run through, so you can see my vlog yesterday, it was e-consultations, um, clinical meeting, tutorial, audit time. Wednesdays is today, so I've got half day of being a duty doctor in the morning and then a half day of GP training in the afternoon. And Thursdays and Fridays I have a full day of normal clinic, so it's, um, as I mentioned before, nine patients in the morning, nine patients in the afternoon for both days. Once I get home, I quickly grab some leftover Vietnamese noodles in the fridge and log on to my teaching. Normally I try to eat beforehand, but as I was running late, I inhale as much of it as possible before this week's speaker comes on, who is an ENT consultant that delivers a fantastic and really relevant presentation. When it's done its job, it falls off and forms dust. The skin in the ear canal can't do that, so it's migratory. We see a lot of ENT in primary care, so I am furiously typing notes as you can see. These teaching sessions are especially valuable if the topic covers a specialty, which you don't have as a rotation or a job included in your GP training. EMT is one of these specialties for me. After my teaching, I always get a severe bout of Zoom fatigue, so I get into bed in my comfy gear. It was really tempting to fall asleep, but I push on through and spend rest of the afternoon doing some portfolio work on 14 fish. 
So that wraps up my two days of my day in the life of a GP trainee vlog. I hope you found this useful, whether you're thinking about applying to medicine, you're thinking about applying to GP training, you're just curious what a GP trainee does on a day-to-day -day basis, you've got nothing to do with medicine, that's cool, I hope you found this useful. I had quite a lot of fun actually um, filming this, um, so I might make more videos if you guys think you know, there's any particular topic you want me to cover. Let me know if you found this useful and take care everyone. Bye.